28-year-old Paul Snable enjoyed a party and enjoyed a drink. But this get-together with friends in the lead-up to Christmas would be his last. There was no body, there was no scene, and there were always two good things to have in the murder investigation. She was just non-cooperative and she just was not going to talk. She wanted to teach him a lesson. We knew that he was involved to a greater extent than what he'd been telling us. I thought, well, if his motorbike was gone, then he would be gone too. And she said, I'm polishing my barrels. And um, her life was in danger. It started in the quiet countryside of Victoria and ended in the Supreme Court, where the Crown described the case as one that could well have come from the pages of The Godfather. But in this drama, the characters were real and the consequences of their actions could never be changed. I was working on the front desk and Paul Friend came in to report Paul Snable missing. Mr Friend told me that he and Snable had been at a party a week earlier. And they both had a lot to drink, and Paul Snable had left that party and uh, hadn't been seen since. He'd known Paul Snable for about six years. He said he was uh, a good bloke. Everybody liked him, didn't have any enemies that he knew of. So Mr Friend had concerns for his welfare. Police learned that while Paul Snable's car and belongings were still at his house, his beloved motorbike was gone. At first I thought he was just gone off riding on his bike and um, hadn't returned back. I thought maybe he's gone with friends, but it was just unusual that we haven't heard from him or, or seen him or just no sight of him at all. The two siblings were close. Earlier in the year, Paul had given away his younger and only sister at her wedding. His partner that day was Karen Randall. They've been in a relationship for a couple of years. It was a stormy on again, off again relationship. And a couple of months previous, Paul had allegedly assaulted Karen Randall and she'd received a black eye. It was at her sister Donna's party that Paul Snable's flatmate had last seen him. But now police discovered that he was last seen at Karen's place. Paul and Donna had gone there after her party. Uh, Karen was in the process of moving and um, Paul was supposedly to help Karen move from the address but instead of helping her move he continued drinking and um, Karen was a bit upset by this and told him that he was not going to help out that he may as well leave and at about five o'clock that day he rode off on his motorbike and that's the last they had seen of him. Well, given the amount of alcohol that it seemed as though he'd consumed, we decided to conduct a, a search along the uh, side of the road that, that he may have travelled. And given that it's a fairly scrubby and bushy area with um, forest plantations and that sort of thing in there, we decided to conduct a line search using the state emergency service personnel. We also brought in the police helicopter. Paul's sister and parents also joined the search. We drive and drive and looked, hoping to see something or find his bike or, or him even on the side of the road or something. Yeah. At this point in time, uh, we're quite concerned about his safety. Uh, if, in fact, uh, he has come off his motorbike on the road. He says the man was not reported missing until last week because his flatmate had thought Snable had taken off on his bike for a few days. However, he became concerned when Snable failed to collect his pay from work. He had come straight from a party the previous night and we understand that he was still under the effects of alcohol. Police fear the missing man may have ridden off a cliff while travelling along the many treacherous roads in the area. As a result of the media coverage that we'd been given, a lady called us and told us that uh, her son had found some motorbike parts at a tip. 
well, the main parts I found along here. Right, and the majority of the stuff was at the Around the here. And then I found around this other side. Now I found the headlight just over here. This was. Right, is that the odd piece that the majority of stuff over there? All the pieces that there, and then just the headlight was just here. And shortly after that, we got another phone call that the tip up the road at Yanar also had some motorbike parts in it. We found the motorbike seat. And right, where did you find that? Did you show us? Just about, I don't know, about there. Was that concealed in any way or just lying on other rubbish? No, it was just lying there. Did you see anything else that looked like motorbike parts? Well, the petrol tank and that front bit looked like Where a... was the petrol tank? Just there, over there. So information was starting to come forward pretty quickly. We closed both tips and the search then began over about three days. As a result, nearly an entire bike in bits was unearthed, consistent with being from Paul Snable's bike. But what was of greater interest was the fact that some of the cables and wiring from the bike were found neatly coiled in plastic bags. Was it possible that Paul had staged his own disappearance? A group of teenage boys found a number of dismantled parts at the Ballara tip on the 8th of November, three days after Paul Snable disappeared. The parts have been identified as belonging to Snable's red and white 250cc Yamaha motorbike. We're very confident at the moment. We've had one of his friends and we've also had a, a motorcycle mechanic who did some work on the bike recently have a look at it. And they're very confident that uh, it is in, in fact his motorcycle. The information we had was, was that he loved his motorcycle and for him to dissect it, break it down into, into the pieces, just didn't fit with the profile that we had established of Paul Snowball. But uh, we also had information from friends that he may well have wanted to leave La Trobe Valley and go to Western Australia, and he may have orchestrated his own disappearance. But then we got a call from a farmer. He uh, had found an engine in his dam. As a result, we went out and had a look at it, and the engine number had been filed off. And I know a little bit about motorcycles and uh, it was obvious to me that it was a Yamaha motorcycle engine. And of course, whoever was responsible didn't want that engine traced for whatever reason. So that was a significant find. The dam itself was in line with the two tips. So we decided to dive a number of dams between there and the tip. We were looking for more motorcycle parts and we were now thinking we might find a body as well. When the dams were searched, they didn't find a body, but they did find a bike frame. And when it, along with the other parts, were connected, they perfectly formed the motorbike that Paul Snabel was riding only four weeks before. That was pretty scary for me at the time. I thought, well, something horrific had happened. Then if his motorbike was gone, then he would be gone too. From a homicide point of view, it was still a missing person situation. There was no body, there was no scene, and there are always two good things to have in the murder investigation. So we decided that the best place to look would be the last place he was seen at, and that was at uh, Karen's place. We took out a warrant to see if we could find out any more information. We had a look around the house and uh, unfortunately we were uh, unable to find anything to assist us. We spoke to Rona Heaney who lived with Karen at the house at Merbu. She confirmed Karen's story that Paul had been at the house drinking that day and had left at approximately 5pm on his motorcycle. Her story verified what uh, Karen and Donna had told us so it really took us no further. And she mentioned as an aside that during the day, she dropped her children off at Jano and Irene Maslin's house in Merbu North. While these two people weren't at the party, they were added to the long list of names that the police were collecting. Those people that we believed were the last people to see and we had on one board and then those people that were on a peripheral nature, friends and that, we had them on another board. So at this stage, the only real evidence police had were the motorcycle parts and the bags in which some of those parts were found. 
One of the detectives recognised the bags as being the type of bags used by the State Electricity Commission and it was organised for one of the employees from the State Electricity Commission to come out and view the bags and he positively identified the bags as being the type of bags that they used at the State Electricity Commission that weren't generally available to the public. So on the off chance, the names on the boards were given to the employee. Very soon after and indicated to us that Jano Maslin was employed at the SEC. Jano Maslin was one of hundreds of people who worked at the State Electricity Commission. He didn't and doesn't have a criminal record. But because his wife Irene knew those who knew Paul Snabel, the detectives paid them a visit. We obtained a search warrant, went out to Jano and Irene Maslin's house. Nice to meet you, Irene. We spoke to Irene. She stated that she'd never met Paul Snabel and the first she'd heard about Paul Snabel or his disappearance was on the news. Jano stated that on the last day that Paul was seen, on the 5th of November, that he was home all day digging in the backyard where they were going to put a swimming pool. And then we searched the garage and we located some of the plastic bags that were used at the SEC, the same sort of plastic bags that had been found at the tip. And we also noticed that there were some cables that had been wound up very neatly, and these were very similar to the way the cables had been wound up and put in the plastic bags and disposed of in the tip. Everything was very neat, and for a garage, it was spotless. The only area that we could find any debris of anything was in the cracks in the concrete. I gathered that dust that accumulated in the cracks and I found some metal fragments and some red paint. We also found a file on the workbench that had remnants of paint embedded into the teeth of the file, which was consistent in colour with the paint that I'd seen on the motorcycle parts and also consistent with the paint flecks that I'd located in the cracks on the floor. Everything that we took from the Maslin's place, we gave to our forensic science people to see if they could uh, match any of that with the motorbike parts that we'd found in the tips and dams. And during that time, we decided to go back and have a talk to Jeno and Irene and see if we could obtain a statement off them as to what they told us they'd been doing on that day. When the police arrived, Jano was a different man. While he had been cooperative the first time around, now he told the investigators that his wife said they would not be making any statements. Nothing to say. We thought we'd go back to the house again and persist with Jano and Irene Maslin to see if they would make a statement. Uh, we got to the house and found nobody was there. We went and spoke to Rona and she stated that they'd gone away for a Christmas holiday, but she didn't know exactly where they, they went. While they wanted to find the Maslins, the detectives had a more pressing engagement. Karen, Paul's ex-girlfriend, had just placed herself in a private clinic. And police wondered if the pressure of the investigation had taken its toll and whether Karen knew more than she had been saying. Karen Randall and Paul Snabel had an on-again, off-again relationship. At the time he went missing, the two were no longer living together. Yet it appeared that Karen was one of the last people to see him. We went to see Karen Randall in hospital. She was in a very uh, frail state of mind and we didn't believe that she was involved in the disappearance of Paul, but we felt that she knew a, a lot more than what she was telling us. When we spoke to Karen, we updated her on where our investigation was going with Paul. It was during that that she broke down and cried and she said that her original statement wasn't correct. In her original statement, she said that herself, Donna and Rona were at the premises of Rona with Paul. But uh, in fact, Irene Maslin was also there. Karen went on to say that Paul was gnawing his jaw in a fashion that indicated he'd been using amphetamines and was physical with her by rubbing his hand up her back, which caused her to make a comment to Irene that she hated that. She also added the fact that uh, she left the premises with Donna and Paul was still at the house with Irene and Rona. The next day Karen and Donna paid a visit to Irene Maslin's house and Irene pulled Karen into her bedroom and sat her down and told her that Paul wouldn't be bothering her anymore. 
and she broke down and uh, cried. As a result of that, Irene told her that uh, she needed to keep herself together or uh, the big boys would come and have a talk to her. So from that, she assumed that uh, Paul had uh, been murdered. Police then spoke with Donna, who confirmed her sister's story. But she too added more to the tale. She said her statement, Karen's original statement, and Rona Heaney's original statement were all concocted by Irene Maslin, who was influencing what they were saying to the police. Then, only a few days later, police learned from Donna that she had a midnight visitor. Donna! Front door! There was a knock on her bedroom window, and there was a person there who said he'd been sent there by Irene Maslin to collect her. Oh, we're going to Geelong. What? We're going to Geelong. Now? Yep. When she arrived at the house where Irene was holidaying, she was taken aside. Rona Heaney was there too. Obviously, Irene Maslin was getting a bit concerned that someone in the group may have been providing information to the police. And uh, Irene suspected that to be Karen and told Donna to go back and tell Karen that she'd need to shut her mouth. You're going to have to tell your little sister Karen here too. Very important. You keep your trap shut. I understand. And right? she said to Donna, I'm polishing my barrels, I think was the expression she used, which Donna took to mean she'd got a gun and her life was in danger. So we were certainly keen to catch up with the Maslins, particularly Irene Maslin herself. We went to an address where we believed the Maslins had stayed and knocked on the door and uh, that was answered by a fellow named Ian Gillen. Ian confirmed that uh, the Maslins had been there but we'd missed them, they'd left the day before. Whether it was good fortune that Irene wasn't around, or whether she was so scared of Irene that she wanted to talk, Donna turned up at the police station to give them yet another chapter in what occurred the day she brought Paul over to Karen and Rona's place. I was on the couch and I think Karen was, must have been in uh, Rona's bed. Um, I heard them discussing or trying to talk Paul into having Oh, I was saying to him, have you ever had speed put up your arm and shot it up and things like that? Who was saying this? Um, Rona and Irene. Eventually they talked him into it. Uh -huh. well, they were there in the kitchen at one stage and then I opened my eyes and they weren't. And then they came out from the direction of the bathroom. And then Irene Maslin confirmed that he had had the injection but it was a combination of amphetamines and battery acid. And um, she said to me, get out of here now, if because he's going to fall. Or if you don't want to see this, I leave or something like that, because they expected him to fall down straight away when they put this stuff in his arm. And at that stage, her and um, Karen left. <laughs> Another important piece of information that Donna provided on this day was the fact that the couch that was present in the Heaney household was sold. Found out later it was because it had stains on it. I presume they meant blood stains. And was it mentioned what sort of stains? No, it wasn't. She just said that they couldn't get rid of the stains, so they had to get rid of the couch. Right. Um, I presume they meant blood, so... As a result of the couch having been sold, we located the person that it had been sold to and seized it under warrant and subjected it to forensic analysis, which confirmed the presence of human blood. I can't even imagine what they did to him. Obviously bashed him or something. The investigation at this stage had really gained momentum. We had a clear focus on Irene Maslin as being involved in either seriously injuring or potentially killing Paul Snowball. Rona Heaney was also seriously implicated, but we, we were concerned as to where they were and how quickly we could track them down. Police were convinced that Irene Maslin and Rona Heaney were involved in Paul Snable's disappearance. But they, along with Irene's husband, were nowhere to be found. When police had gone looking for the Maslins, they met Ian Gillen. At that point, he had little to say. 
Now he contacted the police to tell them he was at the Maslins on the day Paul vanished. He said that he was present at the Maslins household on the 5th of November, digging the foundations for the swimming pool. And that's taken, what, the good part of, uh, of that day? Yes, it has. But at a point in time, Jano Maslin had left the household and a couple of hours later returned and had a trailer on which was a motorcycle. We were told that we had to strip it down. All right. Who said that? Um, Irene. And who was involved in stripping the bike down? Jane, Irene, Rona and I. Now, was anything said to you about uh, where the motorcycle had come from? The reason given to you as to why they had to strip the motorcycle down? No, they were all what was said that the bike had to be stripped down and get rid of. He then took police to the locations where the motorcycle parts were distributed. Right. And what's happened when you've arrived here? Jono threw a tyre in and it wouldn't sink. So then we just grabbed the motor, threw the motor in. And when we got back in the car, I said there's another dam just up further. And right. they went there. And what took place here? Um, threw out a few more things, the frame. The frame on the bike went in. OK, and what's taken place here? Uh, we've had a bag each with all small bits and pieces in and off the bike. And we've gone either way and we've scattered it around the tip. So the tip was chock-a-block full. What sort of bags were they? Clear plastic bags. Mm. Did you at any stage realise that the motorcycle parts and the motorcycle belonged to Paul Snowball? No, I didn't know. This new information from Ian Gillen was certainly confirming what we'd already had suspicions about in terms of the activity in the Maslin garage. So it was hopefully the full picture coming to light at last. But we also had, because of the way things had unfolded to date, an expectation of more information coming forward. Just as Ian Gillen was giving his version of events, the Maslins and Rona Heaney had returned to town. The three were arrested and interviewed, starting with Irene. I must inform you that you are not obliged to say or do anything, but anything you say or do may be given in evidence. Do you understand that? Yes. I must also inform you of the following rights. You may communicate with or attempt to communicate with a friend or relative to inform that person of your whereabouts. Yes. And you may communicate with or attempt to communicate with a legal practitioner. As well as a relative? Yeah, do you understand that? He said I could have a phone book. Right. Who do, who do you wish to contact now? Anyone. That's a solicitor. All right. If you'd like to come this way, we'll organise a telephone call by another telephone call for you. Can I ring information? Yeah, you can ring me if you like. All right. Irene's attitude towards us in the interview was, uh, what I'd say, one of contempt. Uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't discuss anything, wouldn't make any comment to anything. And you just made a telephone call. Uh, have you received any legal advice? Irene, have you see, received any legal advice at all? She was just non-cooperative and she just was not going to talk. I'll ask you again. Do you know a person by the name of Paul Snow? No matter which way you attacked her, you couldn't get anything out of her, and she sat there stony-faced. Can you hear me all right, all right? Do you wish to say anything about what happened at the house in Nichols Road, Merbu North, on the 5th of November, 1989? Irene, you're going to be charged with the murder of Paul Joseph Snable on the 5th day of November, 1989. Rona Heaney, on the other hand, was anything but stony-faced. After you've been in this job for a while, you get to be good at picking body language and reading into the way people conduct themselves. Certainly the way Rona Heaney was conducting herself and her body language was that we were certainly on the money with this one. She was giving us all the good positive signals that she was concerned about what we knew and the extent of her involvement in, in the murder of Paul Snable. Do you know a person by the name of Paul Snable? Yes, I do. And how do you know him? 
through Karen Randall, the girl who used to be with me. Well, in relation to the morning of the, the 5th of November, do you recall certain people attending at your premises? Yes, I do. Who was that? Um, Donna and uh, Paul. And what's taken place when Donna and Paul arrived? Coffee. Rona seemed very nervous, very concerned about the statements that she'd previously made to us that she saw on the interview table. Is that a true and correct statement, is it? I have no comments to make on that one. No comments? No. Is there any reason why you don't want to comment on the truthfulness of the statements that you've made to the police? No, not really. Not it wasn't until after that interview that Rona grabbed hold of myself and uh, Sergeant John Robinson and told us that Ian Gillan was involved to a greater extent than what he'd been telling us. After months of mystery surrounding Paul Snable's disappearance, 32-year-old Irene Maslin, her husband Jan Alfred and friend Rona Heaney were arrested overnight for his murder. Within a short time of being in custody, Rona Heaney had decided that she wasn't going down alone for murder. But her target at this point was not one of her co-accused. Ian was standing at the door with a baseball bat. And I Rona was telling police that Ian Gillen was more involved than simply scattering motorcycle parts at the local tips. What I wish to talk to you about today, Ian, is the murder of Paul Joseph Snavel. All right. Do you know a Paul Snavel? Yes. How do you know a Paul Snavel? I met him on the 5th of November around at Rona's place. And there was a guy sitting on the couch that I've had never met before. Right. And I got introduced to him. His name was Paul Snable. And then Rona asked if we wanted a drink. We said, OK, and Rona and Irene went out to the kitchen. Right. And then I've gone out there. And Irene said, this, this guy's got to go, Ian. Do you want to knock him out for me? And I saw I didn't know how to take it. No, uh, I come back in and had our cuppers. Ian Gillen, his mind is racing and then gets up and takes the cup back out into the kitchen area. And it's there that Irene confronts him again and says, basically, well, are you going to do it? I noticed the baseball bat there. It was leaning right about here, just like that. Right. What's happened then? Oh, I've, I was here for at least five or ten minutes just standing here, right. so I didn't want to do it. What were you thinking at that stage? I was just thinking, I can't do it, I don't want to do it. Ian was standing at the door with a baseball bat and I left the room to go into my son's room and stayed in there for a little while and Mrs Maslin came in and um, I just sort of said, you know, it would be a better idea for Ian to take him outside and just punch him out and send him home. Well, what's happened then? I've walked, it was, I've just walked around here like this with a bat down like this. I've just gone like that. And while I was in the bedroom, all I heard was a clunk. And whereabouts have you hit Paul? I hit him across the head here. In that area? Yes. It was quite odd that although Ian had only met Paul Snabel half an hour before, he hit him with a baseball bat. It seemed that he was very frightened of Irene. Other things crossed my mind. If I don't do it, it could be me. So I had to do it. What's happened to him as a result of being hit by the bat? He's fallen sort of on an angle on the chair right. and blood was dripping onto the carpet. Can you indicate the area on the carpet where the blood was dripping? It's roughly here. Uh, as there was no apparent blood on the surface of the carpet, we lifted the carpet up and on the lining of the carpet there appeared to be possibly blood. Uh, a presumptive test was made of the, the stain which indicated that it was blood and on close inspection of the lounge chairs, on the actual arms, there were traces of what appeared to be flecks of blood. The blood was human blood, but in the absence of DNA testing in 1990, it could not be confirmed as being that of Paul Snabel. But that evidence proved in some way that that uh, murder had occurred within that part of the house.
but had the blow to the head caused his death or what Ian Gillan said that followed. Ira and Ronan came in with a syringe. Ronan had the syringe. And I was supposed to put uh, a needle into Paul's arm, but I couldn't do it because I was too nervous. And they tried injecting it into his arm. While he was still seated in the chair? Or while he was still seated in the chair. Right. And they couldn't get it in his arm. And why didn't you put the needle in his arm? Because I was too nervous to do it and too scared in the long run. And, um, and I the needle was attached to a syringe? Yes, it was. And um, was there anything in the uh, syringe part of it? Yes, there was. What was it? Um, speed and battery acid. It was definitely speed and battery acid. Well, I think, yeah. While all this is happening, Paul Snarble starts to, to make a noise, like he's coming out of a state of unconsciousness. And Gillan's standing there, still can't believe what he's done, but Irene yells out to him to hit him again. And I just gave him another little tap, and he went unconscious again. After the second blow with the baseball bat, there's obviously a lot of blood everywhere, and Ian Gillan races out of the house to get some fresh air. <sighs> Ian was outside and he was, had been sick and then I was outside also and I was sort of a bit sick and said, can I swear or not? Yeah, sure. Because I said, this is really fucked, I want to get out of here. And Ian said, yeah. Then I walked back in and saw Irene had a plastic bag in her hand and she was walking over and she put it over Paul's head and stuck a lacquer, lacquer band around the plastic bag. Oh, and that's while he's still positioned in the chair? Yes. And then about 20 minutes, 15 minutes later, I could see he wasn't breathing anymore. So it was very important now, as part of the corroboration process, locate the deceased and establish the exact means of death. In her walk around confession, Rona Heaney spoke about what she and Irene did with Paul's body. We drove to a place called Shady Creek but I've never been there before. And you found a spot in the bush? Yeah, we bush bashed for a little while. Paul was obviously in the car. Yes. Whereabouts? Um, in the back of the Subaru. Right. Was he covered with anything or...? Um, I think he was covered with a tarp. And how did he get out of the, the back of the car? Um, Irene asked me to give her a hand. So I went to, but I was going to be sick. So I went back to the side of the Subaru and stayed on that side for a while and just dragged some bushes over to the back of the Subaru and didn't really see what happened after that, really. So we, we drove up. Rona then took the investigators to where she and Irene had been some 10 weeks before. No, I'm, I'm, I'm 99% certain it's down here. Rona was unable to show police exactly where Paul's body had been dumped. But she and Ian Gillen had provided the detectives with a motive for his murder. The who and why shocked police, and more arrests were about to be made. Ian Gillen had told police that Paul had been murdered. And I've just gone like that. He also told them a reason why. And we saw Irene standing in the shed here. Right. And she had a container and a syringe in her hand. And I asked what was she doing. She was, said she was filling it up. The guy Paul inside, he's got to go. She said he's always bashing Karen. Karen's too scared to go and tell the police about it. He, he has to go, otherwise he'll get Karen first. It was a claim backed up by Rona. But Rona and Irene were not alone in conspiring to murder. You'd obviously talked about this for quite a while before. Two days. Two days? Yeah. And when the conversation was being held, uh, who was party to the conversation? Um, Irene and myself, Donna and Karen. So they all knew what was going to happen? Yeah. And you all intended him, that he would die? Yeah. All right. I was a bit shocked to find out this information because um, Karen and Donna had been very helpful to police throughout the investigation and now, instead of being helpful witnesses, they were in fact main suspects. Now we had to look at them as being part of this conspiracy to murder Paul Stable, so we had to go and interview them. There was, there was a discussion about 
Paul. Irene wanted to dispose of Paul. She said that she wanted to, she wanted to teach him a lesson. Irene didn't like him. She really didn't like him. Irene thought he was okay, you know. But then, you know. Is there any specific reason why Irene didn't like him? Um, I don't, well, what all I can think of is because she saw me with black eye. Mm -hmm. He, she hadn't really met him all that often, so she didn't really have a chance to get to know him. Um, but she just said that she wants to dispose of him. What do you understand her to mean? Well, to get rid of him, I, I imagine just to murder him. We found out that um, everybody had a role to play. I was supposed to talk him into going out to Mervyn North. Right. Um, Karen was supposed to entice him out there. Mm. They felt that I would be the best one to get him out there because he'd come out if I asked him to come out. So Donna had a party at her house and invited Paul over. And while Paul was there, Karen rang up and invited Paul to her place. Yeah! Donna drove Paul out to the house at Merboo and at the house, Irene and Rona were there, and their role was to give Paul a shot of battery acid which they thought would kill him. I expected him to fall straight away, to fall down straight away when they put this stuff in his arm. But he was fine, he was outside riding the, the walking around, riding the motorbike around, stuff like that. No, I saw him riding up in the paddock, in the top paddock, and he sort of getting bogged and he wasn't handling it too well. So I said to Ramona, I want, I want your car keys, I want to go. And um, I was shaking, I, I was a mess, I just didn't know what to do. That's when Karen and Donna took off. And when that shot of battery acid didn't work, Irene enlisted the help of Ian to hit Paul over the head with a baseball bat. And when he was still alive, Irene stepped in with a plastic bag to finish him off. The two sisters were charged with causing the death of Paul Snabel. While they had left the property when Paul was alive, they had been part of the planning. They knew what was going to happen to him and did nothing to prevent it. I didn't really think it, that it really happened. Um... Well, I suggest that bearing in mind uh, the talk of the battery acid and the fact that you knew um, what could happen when someone was injected there. You knew I knew that, that I knew that they were talking about that. I knew that um, the battery acid would kill someone. Right. Uh, did you contact Paul at all? Um, I don't think so. You didn't ring him up and um, or no. warn him or tell anyone else that he shouldn't go to a party or anything. No, I didn't. I didn't um, contact him at all. All right. At no stage have you gone to the police or alerted anyone of what was going to take place as a result of that discussion? No, I didn't really. Well, can you explain why you haven't done that? Because I was scared. I don't know whether you believe me or not, but I was scared. I've never come across anything like it before. So we have a number of people who were charged with murder and yet we still don't have a body and obviously it was the icing on the cake if we could locate the exact whereabouts of Paul Snowball's body and corroborate from a forensic point of view the evidence that was necessary to support the versions of events that we had. And after closely searching the area that Rona Heaney had identified as being the place where Paul Snabel's body was dumped, the team came across clothes and a number of bones, including a skull and jaw. And these were very important findings because it is the skull and the jaws particularly that we can use to identify someone. A detailed dental examination was carried out and the teeth found in both the upper jaw and the lower jaw matched the dental records of Paul Snabel. Paul's skull also provided other corroborating evidence. When we examined the skull, we found that on the left side of the head there were major fracture lines that were radiating across from the side of the head and the fracture pattern 
was such that it would have indicated that there were a number of blows of very significant force delivered to the head. And blows of that type are likely to cause um, immediate unconsciousness, if not death. And there was even further forensic evidence found at the scene. Where the remains were found, there was also a plastic bag located, and that corroborated the fact that we'd been told that Irene had put the plastic bag over his head at the house, and so that was a vital piece of evidence too. There was also a log that had a paint smudging on it. Rona Heaney described how the Subaru got snagged on something in the course of doing a three-point turn. So when we located that log, with that colour paint, that was quite a breakthrough in terms of making that nexus between the Maslin vehicle and the presence of that vehicle at the scene where the remains were located. There is no doubt when I went to the scene that day, I was excited. I knew that we had enough evidence at that scene to get there and take this all away. Initially, proceedings were initiated against Donna and Karen Randall Ian Gillen and Rona Heaney, because the amount of evidence that we'd been able to accumulate during the course of the investigation was greater against them than it was against the Maslins. Rona, Donna and Karen were found guilty of murder. The three appealed. Rona's was rejected and she served 10 years in prison. The sisters were granted a retrial where they were convicted of attempted murder. They served two years behind bars. Ian Gillen was ultimately convicted of manslaughter. He was substantially different to the others in that he wasn't present at that initial discussion, wasn't party to the plan to kill Paul Snable, as well as it couldn't be established that his actions caused the actual death of Paul, given that other people engaged in actions that contributed as well. After Rona, Ian and the girl Randalls had been found guilty, we used the evidence of the co-accused, that being the four, to give evidence against the two Maslins. As a result, Irene Maslin decided to plead guilty to the murder of Paul Snabel. She served 10 years in jail. Her husband was acquitted of the charge. It's really hard for me to pinpoint exactly why poor Snowball was killed. We were told things in bits and pieces, drip-fed information, lied to, and ultimately, at the end of the day, got a more complete picture. But as to whether that's the true version, I don't think that information can be ever relied upon with any great certainty. It was only a year apart for me, and we were fairly close, and he was the I loved to look after his little sister and bought me gifts for my birthday and Christmas. He always cuddled me and kissed me and told me how much he loved me. And he was just always happy and very caring and the manner of the murder was just horrific. Still can't believe they did it. Mm.